Good morning, everybody. Um, so welcome to our weekly medical grand rounds. Um, so Dr. Rashmi Kurana, um, I, I, I'm delighted to welcome in our Meet the Professor series um, as she was promoted this past year. Um, she's a general internist who has completed advanced training in obstetric medicine at Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, she established the obstetric medicine program at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in 2000, and she's the director of that program currently. She coordinates the obstetric medicine rotation for residents, and in addition to her clinical, administrative, and educational activities, she's involved in research in pregnancy, and her area of focus recently has been physical activity in pregnancy. So um, just for a change of pace, uh, Rashmi is going to talk to us about the birth and growth of the obstetric medicine program. Thank you, Norman. Um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to allow me to present today. Um, so I, I struggled a bit to know what to present because uh, um, the people at the university, they don't see pregnant women very often. And um, so I thought I'd probably describe a little bit, oops, hang on. Uh, I thought I'd describe a bit about the structure of the program in Edmonton, a bit about its history and, and how we function. And then I thought it might be interesting to go through some cases uh, that we've had recently that exemplify what we do and how we can help you look after your patients. And then at the end, I thought I'd talk a bit about some of the recent research I've been doing with uh, some colleagues at the university. Um, I don't have any relevant uh, disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. Um, so as Norman said, I uh, did uh, my, my fellowship at uh, Brown University and I got interested in the topic because I never saw a pregnant woman during my residency, uh, but uh, I attended the ACP conference and I did a workshop because I was told this is going to be on your Royal College exam, so you have to know a bit about it, and I uh, fell in love with the topic. So after I did my uh, fellowship, I went looking for jobs and this was a really new area that people didn't know much about, so I sent letters to to every program in Canada, both to the obstetrics department and the medicine department. And uh, so Tom Mary, who was the chair uh, at that time, uh, saw that uh, maybe my expertise might be useful in Edmonton. Um, and uh, so uh, he uh, hired me and uh, I started at the Royal Alexander Hospital. And I, I, I think Chuck Harley's uh, um, on the uh, webinar today and uh, Chuck was, sort of helped me settle in at the Royal Alexander Hospital in that 2000. So since that time, so I was by myself for a couple of years and then uh, Dr. Winnie C.S. Uh, joined me and since that time we've grown and this is our core group now so besides myself and Dr. Sia there's Dr. Aaron Tour, Dr. Katie Ross, uh, Dr. Jordan Merritt uh, joined us in the last uh, year and a bit. Um, in our clinics we also have a uh, nurse practitioner Debbie Germain, uh, dietitian Anina Enstrom and, uh, and pharmacist Jody Wilkie. And then besides our core members, we also have other um, uh, colleagues with obstetric medicine training who uh, are really um, helpful. So uh, Dr. Alaga also works at the ALEC and he helps on our consult service and he's a trained endocrinologist. And next uh, week for Medicine Grand Rounds at the ALEC, he's presenting on adrenal insufficiency in pregnancy. So um, uh, stay tuned for that. Dr. Jillian Ramsey is at the Grey Nuns Hospital and sees patients there. Dr. Mona Gill at the Misericordia Hospital. And then uh, two recent graduates, Dr. Lillian Chan and Dr. Patricia Araneta um, also did some fellowship training with us. Um, so I often get asked, what is an obstetric internist? And uh, so, um, if you look up Wikipedia, it's a, it's terrible. It, don't read Wikipedia for obstetric uh, medicine. But, um, you know, we're internists with further training in the care of uh, pregnant patients with medical problems. And uh, often we get confused with maternal fetal medicine. And so I thought I'd spend a minute just to uh, telling the difference between the two because many of the consults we get are directed to us, but uh, calling us maternal fetal medicine doctors. So obstetric medicine is primarily a GIM subspecialty. So we have extra training in medical problems in pregnancy and we come at things from an internist perspective. We don't do prenatal care, we don't do fetal surveillance and we don't deliver babies. Meanwhile, um, maternal fetal medicine, which is sometimes called perinatology, 
uh, are obstetricians who do further subspecialty training in high-risk pregnancy, and they do do a lot of fetal surveillance. They also deal with uh, maternal medical issues. And in Edmonton, they work as um, consultants to the obstetricians, so they don't do prenatal care and they don't deliver babies, but in other centers, they may uh, have those functions. Uh, internationally, we have societies in North America and the UK and uh, New Zealand, and we have a journal. Uh, and in Edmonton, so we have a 24-7 inpatient consult service that's, uh, that's active uh, at that hospital. We also are happy to offer phone advice. Uh, so sometimes there's pregnant patients admitted to the university hospital and uh, we get calls about those or other hospitals in the city or um, Northern Alberta, Northwest Territories, etc. We have a busy outpatient uh, practice. So uh, we have general obstetric medicine clinics uh, where we see all sorts of things, hypertension, renal disease, et cetera. Uh, we also participate in the diabetes and pregnancy clinics with our other internal medicine and endocrine colleagues. And then we have a couple of specialty clinics. So Dr. Sia started the postpartum preeclampsia clinic. And this was a clinic that was started um, because there was growing research that individuals who had had preeclampsia had higher risks of cardiovascular disease. Um, women who had recurrent events and those who had uh, preeclampsia and delivered early from it um, had increased risk and the events can occur at a relatively young age. And so this clinic was established to look at vascular risk reduction in these women at high risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, we've also established the Maternal Heart Health Clinic. And this is a joint clinic that we do with um, two colleagues from cardiology who have expertise in pregnancy. So Dr. Wahab from the CK Huey and Dr. Jonathan Windrum from uh, the Mazinkowski. And it's a clinic for patients with either congenital or acquired heart disease, um, either before pregnancy when they're looking at the risks or during pregnancy. We try to offer a one-stop shop to these women. So in the morning, they get a maternal echocardiogram. Um, that's often followed by a fetal ultrasound with our maternal fetal medicine colleagues. And they're across the hall from us um, at the lowest hole. Um, the patient may also need a fetal echo. So if she has congenital heart disease, her baby is, is at higher risk of congenital heart disease. And um, then in the afternoon, we'll see them jointly with cardiology at the same time. And at the end of clinic, all the cases are reviewed with maternal fetal medicine. So we can come up with a plan for their care um, that's cohesive. One of the nice things is we establish a detailed delivery plan and that really has helped to lower the anxiety and stress that the obstetric care team feels when these patients present for labor and delivery. Uh, in terms of education, we have a rotation that's a required rotation for the GIM residents at the U of A. Uh, we also have the um, residents uh, from Newfoundland and Memorial University come because they don't have local expertise. And then uh, since in Edmonton, the, the majority of maternal medicine is done by our group, the OB residents is, uh, are um, required to rotate with us as well. Um, we have an elective for other learners, as well as um, we take uh, fellows. Um, we've had fellows from um, uh, parts of other parts of Canada, as well as from Saudi Arabia. So I thought I'd uh, just uh, present a few cases um, and uh, I picked four different cases that look at four different sort of uh, perspectives of what we do. So the first is on preconception counseling. Uh, we often see women to see, you know, what is their risk during pregnancy and how can we optimize uh, their outcomes. Sometimes we get asked to see women for disorders unique to pregnancy, such as preeclampsia or cholestasis of pregnancy. Um, often we're asked to weigh in if women are considering using medications that are not commonly used in pregnancy or, or imaging modalities sometimes. And then there are often complex patients that have multiple specialists involved when we often act as quarterback for these patients to try to top tie things together. 
Um, so the first case uh, is, a, is a woman that we saw in our maternal heart health clinic, and she was a 37-year-old woman referred by the heart function clinic. She was diagnosed with a dilated cardiomyopathy many years ago, and at that time, she had a really reduced ejection fraction of 20% but with the excellent care uh, provided by the heart function clinic, she was now um, uh, had an EF of 35 to 40% and, and class two dyspnea. So she functioned really well. She'd had a primary prevention ICD placed a few years before, and she was on optical, uh, optimal medical therapy with bisoprolol, furosemide, evabradine, perindopril, and spironolactone. So she called the heart function clinic saying, you know, I'm actually trying to have a baby. So they um, stopped her perindopril and spironolactone and they added hydralazine and nitrates and they asked us to see her. So we got some additional history. She also had type two diabetes uh, that was diagnosed eight years before and followed by her family doctor. She was on metformin and recently had been started on, on empagliflozin. And um, her control was actually not that good. So she rarely monitored, her A1C was 9%. She'd had some complications. So she had proliferative retinopathy and that had required ongoing treatment with injections. She had a, a few other issues. She had obesity and hypothyroidism. And um, you know, when we talked to her, we found out she actually had not been using contraception for the last two years, even though she'd been sexually active with her partner. So, uh, you know, we talked to her about the issues and, and the risks uh, that she faced. So even though her EF was 35 to 40%, that was on optimal medical therapy. And when we look at women who have moderate cardiac uh, LV dysfunction, moderate LV dysfunction, um, there's a, a, a classification system called the modified WHO classification for women with cardiac disease in pregnancy. And this put her in a class three, uh, which is really, you have to be very cautious because of um, uh, poor outcomes. So this gives her a cardiac event rate of 19 to 27% for women in this, in this category uh, with an increase in maternal mortality as well that, um, that can happen. So optimally for pregnancy, we would not want her to be on perindopril or spironolactone or vabradine, and um, that she was uh, on hydrolysis and nitrates, which have been substituted, but these are not as effective. And additionally, there's the extra physiologic burden of pregnancy that she's going to face, and it's unclear how her heart is going to cope with that. So she has increased risks of heart failure and hospitalization with a small increase in maternal mortality. And then the concern is that perhaps she might also have a permanent decline in her cardiac function that could decrease her lifespan. As well, she's a type two diabetic with suboptimal control, and this leads to an increased risk of miscarriage and congenital anomalies. Um, there's other fetal risks for her, so macrosomia, stillbirth, uh, preterm delivery, neonatal complications. Um, she herself has a higher risk of preeclampsia requiring a C-section. And then um, she has proliferative retinopathy already, so it's important that um, she gets assessed by ophthalmologist because there's an increased risk of progression in pregnancy. For her diabetes control, we can continue the metformin, but she'd need to stop the empagliflozin and start insulin four times a day. And it's a lot of work for these women because they have to monitor their blood sugars four times a day and aim for really very tight control. She also likely has infertility, so she's not used contraception for two years. And so all these efforts that she might make if she's proceeds with a pregnancy, she might have to keep up for a long time because it could take her a long time to get pregnant. And this may uh, cause compromise in her long-term health. So what did we decide? So we told her she needs to start contraception again. So even though she's had infertility, probably uh, we want to make sure she doesn't get contraception until we can make sure she's optimized and whether it's reasonable for her to try to get pregnant. Uh, we repeated her echocardiogram now that she'd been off her ACE and spironolactone. And fortunately, it was stable. And she's booked now for an exercise stress echo. Um, and if, if that shows that she's functioning okay, then we'll stop the evabradine and repeat her echo in another five to six months to see uh, how her heart is functioning. If she has any deterioration along the way, then we're going to strongly advise against pregnancy. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll still tell her that if she goes ahead and gets pregnant, we'll support her. 
but uh, she's actually considering that whether a surrogate might not be a better option for her. And then throughout all this, of course, she needs better control of her diabetes and follow up with ophthalmology. Um, Okay, so the second case uh, I want to present was a 33-year-old woman, and this was her first pregnancy, and she was at 29 weeks, uh, and she presented with what looked like preeclampsia, so hypertension, um, she had headaches, scotoma, and edema, and she had been followed by maternal fetal medicine since about 20 weeks because of some concern about uh, placental insufficiency, so abnormal Dopplers on her ultrasound and a decline in fetal growth. And her lab work when she was admitted, so she had severe thrombocytopenia, she had evidence of hemolysis with the elevated LDH and some schistocytes seen on her smear, she had an elevated uric acid and she had acute kidney injury with a creatinine of 127 and previously that had been normal. Her, her coags were normal though. So the uh, obstetricians assessed her baby and there was concerns of fetal compromise. She had prolonged decelerations and evidence of uh, really abnormal Dopplers and brain sparing. And so um, the working diagnosis was that she had preeclampsia with possibly a concealed eruption. So she was given steroids, she was given some IV magnesium sulfate, um, and she was given a platelet transfusion and taken for an urgent C-section. And she had a baby girl who went to the NICU, but was a bit sluggish at birth. So I met her on post-op day one. And um, so at that point, so she had features of preeclampsia. She had hypertension, her uh, urine PCR had come back and she had proteinuria. She had thrombocytopenia and um, renal dysfunction, as well as evidence of hemolysis and elevated uric acid and the placental insufficiency also fit with preeclampsia. But, you know, there were some features that were not typical of preeclampsia. So it's unusual to have um, such significant thrombocytopenia as well as hemolysis without having elevated liver enzymes. Um, so, um, you know, I spoke with the hematopathologist at the time and uh, we uh, got approval to get uh, Adam TS-13 uh, ordered. Um, so she continued to improve. We were waiting for the results and watching her clinically. And uh, so clinically, she was improving. We had to uh, adjust her antihypertensives and her labs were slowly improving. So her, her platelets were, were climbing up, her creatinine sort of peaked and then started to fall. Um, and uh, on her smear, the, they didn't see too much uh, evidence of hemolysis anymore. And her LD was slowly coming down. But you know, the rate of improvement was also not typical for preeclampsia. So some things can take quite a while to improve, but usually when those platelets start to improve, they tend to bounce back pretty quickly. And on post-op day four, her Adam TS-13 came back and it was a little bit on the low side, but not low enough to be diagnostic of TTP. So um, usually that's a level of less than 0 0.1 and hers was 0 0.12. Uh, but when her case was reviewed, you know, she had had a platelet transfusion and uh, so she would have gotten some plasma as part of that platelet transfusion. So there's concern that that might have uh, affected the results. So she had another Adam TS-13 drawn and the lab was able to run that uh, a little more um, uh, quickly and the repeat level was uh, actually uh, diagnostic of TTP. At that time, even though she was looking pretty well, she was brought to the ICU for urgent plasma exchange and started on steroids. And uh, she had ongoing treatment for hypertension. And she had four cycles of plasma exchange. And actually with that, all her lab tests normalized and her blood pressure also improved significantly. Um, and then further um, follow up with hematology, she had genetic testing and was found to have congenital TTP, uh, which is an issue where you have a decrease in the Adam TS13 protein, but you, you don't have an inhibitor. So since that time, uh, she's had further preconception counseling because she's uh, wanting another pregnancy. So she's seen hematology and I've seen her as well. And the plan is for uh, regular plasma infusions to supply the Adam uh, TS13 protein that she uh, has a deficiency of, as well as measures to help 
prevent uh, preeclampsia, such as uh, aspirin and calcium and exercise and weight management. And um, she's actually newly pregnant again and is starting those therapies. Okay, uh, the third case uh, I wanna present is a 38 year old woman and she was uh, pregnant at 28 weeks gestation. Um, she presented with flank pain and nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. And her background was significant for parathyroid carcinoma that had been diagnosed eight years prior. She was initially treated with surgery and radiation. And then four years after that, she had uh, a local recurrence in her mediastinum that was treated with more surgery and radiation. She'd been disease free for several years. So at the time she presented, she was hypercalcemic and her parathyroid hormone was also elevated. She had some limited improvement with IV hydration and a loop diuretic. And so the presumptive diagnosis was recurrence of her parathyroid cancer. Um, so we went over the different options. One was to watch and wait, but she had significant hypercalcemia. And one of the concerns is that if the mom is hypercalcemic, then the baby also is hypercalcemic and that suppresses fetal parathyroid hormone um, uh, production, um, which leads to risks for the baby at birth. So hypocalcemia, tetany and seizures, and also some risk of neonatal mortality. So it's recommended if there is significant hypercalcemia during pregnancy, that consideration for um, uh, surgery uh, in the second trimester be done. Um, so the other option was medical treatment, but um, there's issues about limited effectiveness of, of medications such as calcitonin, uh, which has tachyphylaxis or limited safety data for other medications such as bisphosphonates. Um, and then the third option was surgical treatment. But one of the issues we had is we, we don't know where the recurrence is. And so she had an ultrasound of her neck that was unremarkable, didn't really show anything. She also had an MRI um, of her neck and mediastinum, uh, mediastinum that was non-diagnostic. So we had a multidisciplinary meeting uh, with her various physicians and a discussion. And we also had a discussion with nuclear radiology and we decided to do a PET CT. So this is her PET CT. And so you can see uh, here um, how the baby uh, is lighting up with a tracer. So it's increased metabolism. And then she had dedicated views of her neck. And here you can see lighting up a node in her supraclavicular area. So the physicist estimated uh, uh, the fetal radiation for her baby, and that was estimated to be a total of 5.9 milligray. So um, 2.8 milligray from the tracer and 3.1 milligray from low dose CT scan. And so if you think about, well, is this a high dose or not? We can talk about the maximum recommended uh, radiation dose to a fetus during pregnancy is, is 50 milligrays. So we like to stay well underneath that. And so you can see that um, she had uh, about six milligray, which is well below that maximum recommended amount. So at 30 weeks with this information, she had excision of her affected node under local anesthesia and promptly she had normalization of her calcium and her PTH became suppressed and she had, the rest of her pregnancy was uncomplicated and she had a vaginal delivery uh, at term of a, of a healthy baby. So in this case, um, this really changed uh, her uh, management. And we published this case as well as a review of other cases of uh, PET scanning in pregnancy and um, made some recommendations. And I think, you know, along with using a multidisciplinary approach and using methods to try to um, reduce the radiation dose, uh, et cetera, and having um, the help of a, a medical physicist if available, one of the big things to think about is that we should consider the all standard uh, imaging modalities when evaluating these pregnant women, particularly if it will change the management, because sometimes it's assumed that you can't do something when it is acceptable to do. And the other thing is that it's important when talking to these women is to counsel them about the risks, but also about the benefits of the therapy or uh, diagnostic procedure that you're proposing, because the benefits of the information obtained in this case were very significant. 
Okay, um, the last case uh, was a very recent case. Um, and uh, this is a 24 year old woman, a First Nations woman in her first pregnancy. And she was transferred from the Northwest Territories with a suspected abruption um, at um, almost 31 weeks. And so at there she had presented with back and abdominal pain that had been controlled with opioids. Her blood pressure had initially been high at the time she presented, but had now normalized. Uh, she'd had a fetal ultrasound that was reassuring without evidence of abruption, although sometimes uh, often that's not seen on ultrasound. It's more of a clinical diagnosis. And um, so then she was sent for abdominal ultrasound to look for other causes of abdominal pain, such as renal colic. Um, we got asked to see her for GDM management because she has gestational diabetes and she had received steroids for a fetal lung maturity. Uh, so while we are assessing the patient, um, the results of her abdominal ultrasound came back and it showed an aortic dissection. So they could see a dissection flap in the abdominal aorta extending into the iliac vessels. Um, they couldn't see the proximal event and they could see that she had perfused into her kidneys bilaterally, although one of the kidneys was being perfused by the false uh, lumen. Um, we got pretty concerned about this uh, diagnosis, uh, but the patient looked stable. Her blood pressure was normal. Her heart rate was in the 70s. She had equal pulses and blood pressure bilaterally. We wondered if she had features of Marfan, although she didn't have this diagnosis uh, ever made before. Um, and uh, we paged vascular surgery, but they were busy in the OR and they're not located at the ALEC. So uh, um, they were in a different hospital. And we gave her some IV labetalol to control her blood pressure and heart rate even further. Uh, we were able to get an urgent echocardiogram and this showed that her aortic root was severely dilated, so 4.9 centimeters, and it looked dysmorphic like you might see with a connective uh, tissue disease. They saw some echogenic lines intermittently and so they wondered about type B dissection but couldn't confirm it. Uh, and her uh, ascending aorta seemed normal uh, though. Uh, she then had a CT scan of the chest because we didn't know if this was a type A or type B dissection. And fortunately, it showed a type B dissection all the way from uh, the aortic isthmus uh, going down. And uh, they didn't image her um, abdomen and pelvis, uh, but from the ultrasound, we know that it went right down to the iliacs. Um, so vascular surgery, we finally reached them over the phone and um, they gave some phone advice and they said they would just recommend medical management only and control of blood pressure and heart rate and they didn't see any need for any additional therapy uh, for her. Um, so we were pretty worried about this patient and uh, we talked to ICU and CCU. So CCU took her in transfer um, so they could watch her uh, hemodynamics a little more carefully. Um, so all sort of happened uh, during a day. And so that evening I spoke to uh, Dr. Winder, my colleague and uh, from uh, obstetric cardiology, and uh, he was able to um, uh, also arrange to have Dr. Moon from CV surgery uh, talk. And we agreed um, that uh, the hemodynamics of the pregnancy were likely contributing to stress on this aorta. So even though we would do medical management for her type B dissection, there was concern about extension of this dissection and about this very diluted aortic root. Um, and given that she was already at about 31 weeks gestation, probably the best option would be to consider delivery. Um, the following morning, um, we arranged a multidisciplinary meeting with obstetrics and maternal fetal medicine and, and ICU and um, talked together and everyone agreed that delivery was a good plan and that it should take play, uh, place at the Mazankowski so that if anything did happen um, with her aorta, that could be dealt with at that time. So she was transferred to the Mazankowski with a plan for a C-section uh, the following day. Uh, that night, uh, she unfortunately had worsening abdominal pain, so she had a, a CT of her chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And so you can see her baby here. And you can, if you look carefully, you can see this looks like where her dissection is. Um, so fortunately, the CT did not show extension of her dissection, but... Um, the uh, obstetrician uh, was contacted and uh, surgery uh, and everyone decided that she should have a, a delivery that night rather than waiting till the next day. And so she had a C-section under a general anesthesia of a baby boy who went to the NICU. 
Um, Post-op day five, she complained of increased abdominal pain and she had an MRI, which showed significant increase in uh, dimensions of her aneurysm. Um, fortunately, she stabilized and she remains at the Mazankowski. And the hope is that she'll have some delayed aortic surgery to replace that uh, aortic root. Um, and they're hoping to get some time because the tissues are, are more friable and harder to work with in the postpartum state. Okay, so I'm just going to switch uh, gears a bit and talk about some of the recent uh, research I've uh, been doing. And this has been uh, with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Marky Davenport from the Faculty of uh, Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation. And Dr. Davenport is one of the authors of the uh, recent 2019 Guidelines for Physical Activity uh, During Pregnancy. So um, these are really uh, great guidelines and they recommend um, that for most uh, healthy pregnant women that uh, 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity um, spread throughout the week uh, gives meaningful uh, benefits uh, for reduction in hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, reduction in uh, diabetes in pregnancy, reduction in depressive symptoms. Um, and this is without compromise to the fetus, without increases found in a preterm birth or small for gestational age or for miscarriage. So I've been trying to incorporate uh, that in my patient encounters and recommending to the patients that I see that, you know, if they don't have any contraindications that they should try to increase their physical activity in pregnancy. So one of the things that a lot of women tell me is, well, you know, they're, they're really busy. They have a full-time job and, um, by the way, they're, they're busy at work. So they're on their feet a lot. And so that really counts as physical activity for them. And uh, I remember during my pregnancy being on the wards and thinking mind that, that, okay, even if I didn't have time to exercise, at least I was on my feet and not just sitting the whole time. So we decided to look at this issue, you know, what about occupational activity and does it have uh, benefits or are there harm from occupational activity in pregnancy? This was a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, and the population we were looking at was women who were engaged in paid work during pregnancy um, and looking at jobs where there was heavy lifting, prolonged standing, working, uh, walking, or uh, heavy physical uh, workload and comparing it to pregnant women who didn't have these uh, exposures in their, in their jobs. And we looked at different pregnancy outcomes and in total we had 80 studies looking at over 800,000 pregnant women. So what did we find? We found that lifting more than 100 kilograms per day, so you can imagine that um, uh, some of these might be you know, factory jobs, but maybe some of our nursing colleagues may be doing this, uh, standing more than four hours per day or a heavy physical workload, increase the odds of a preterm delivery. We also found that standing for more than four hours a day Walking for more than four hours a day or a heavy physical uh, workload increase the odds for small for gestational age. Uh, what about uh, shift workers um, and for uh, uh, pregnant individuals that have long working hours like a lot of residents or physicians? So we looked at this topic as well and uh, women in paid work during pregnancy, we looked at rotating shifts or fixed night shifts or um, uh, pregnant individuals that had long working hours of more than 40 hours per week and compared them to those who had either day shifts only and also those who had uh, up to 40 hours a week of work. And in all, there were 62 studies looking at this issue um, with almost 170,000 pregnant women. And we found that women who worked rotating shift works fixed night shifts or worked long working hours, so more than 40 hours per week, had an increase in the odds of preterm delivery. And those who worked night shifts only or worked uh, long working hours uh, increased the odds of miscarriage. So it, it seems like the, uh, the physical activities that's done in an occupational job doesn't have the same benefits as leisure time physical activity. Um, you know, shortly after this was published, then uh, the Indiana State um, uh, 
University School of Medicine uh, changed their policy and established some uh, flexible uh, scheduling policy for residents who were pregnant or uh, new parents uh, in order to allow uh, individuals the choice of whether to do a call during the first and uh, third trimester and they, they published on this. So there is this leisure and occupational physical activity paradox. So, you know, uh, leisure physical activity seems to lead to improved outcomes, whereas occupational physical activity leads to increased risk. And why might that be? Well, leisure time activity tends to be of higher intensity and shorter duration, more controlled, and women often have sufficient rest afterwards, whereas occupational activity, you know, lower intensity, but longer duration, less controlled, uh, and likely with insufficient rest. Uh, one of the other areas where uh, uh, I've been interested is exercise in twin pregnancies. I'm, I myself had a twin pregnancy and, um, you know, the first part of my pregnancy I spent busy on the wards and the second part I spent uh, off work because of complications and uh, off my feet. And a lot of the studies we have looking at the safety of uh, and benefits of physical activity in pregnancy are from singleton pregnancies. And we know that so cardiac responses and exercise are, are similar to non-pregnant and that fetal well-being is maintained. Uh, in contrast, in twin pregnancies, guidelines are often recommending that uh, activity is ceased later in pregnancy. Uh, many uh, individuals with twin pregnancy are prescribed activity restriction like I was. They're considered high risk and this is not based on empirical evidence, however. So we uh, looked at this topic and did an online questionnaire of individuals with twin pregnancy. And um, of 335 respondents, there were 30% uh, of them had uncomplicated pregnancy. And of those uncomplicated pregnancies, um, their healthcare provider told 18% of them to restrict their activity. And a further 65% made a personal choice to restrict activity. And when we looked at the reasons why, well, about a quarter of them, they stopped activity because of concerns about fetal well-being and what the risks of the activity might be. So we sought to investigate the acute maternal and fetal responses to aerobic exercise in twin pregnancies. Uh, and this is part of an, um, a, a study, and I'm just presenting data on, on 10 singleton and 10 twin pregnancies. And um, the individuals would come, the participants would come, and they would get baseline assessment of um, heart rate uh, and calculation of heart rate reserve uh, and assessment of fetal well-being by ultrasound. And uh, this is in Dr. Uh, Davenport's uh, lab at the university. And then they would be asked to do uh, cycling on a reclining uh, uh, cycle uh, ergometer and asked to cycle to 70% of their uh, calculated heart rate reserve. Um, so uh, we looked at 10 singleton and 10 twin pregnancies that were matched for gestational age and they were matched for height and pre-pregnancy BMI and uh, looked at heart rate, blood pressure, maternal cardiac function, as well as having uh, fetal well-being assessed immediately before and immediately after exercise. So what did we find? We found that uh, at rest, individuals with twin pregnancies have greater cardiac demand. So they have higher cardiac output and higher heart rate, which is not surprising. During pregnancy, the blood pressure and heart rate were similar in the singleton and twin pregnancies. And so the increases in cardiac output may be blunted, likely as they're already working into their physiologic reserve. Uh, fortunately, no adverse fetal responses were seen uh, to vigorous exercise in twin pregnancy. And this is the first empirical data that we have that fetal well being is not compromised following maternal exercise in twin pregnancies. And it's really a critical first step to supporting physical activity in healthy twin pregnancies. Uh, the last study I'm just going to briefly talk about is um, a study that we're currently trying to recruit for looking at uh, exercise timing and gestational diabetes. So we know that exercise uh, is useful to help prevent gestational diabetes. And we also know that exercise can be beneficial in helping control blood sugars in women with gestational diabetes. In, in our clinic, we encourage women to um, add some walking or some exercise uh, if they have no contraindication, but we don't really know the optimal timing of exercise. So we often recommend to these women to do uh, short bouts of exercise after a meal, but is that really better than doing 
having uh, a longer bout of exercise uh, in between meals. So this study um, asked women to uh, participate for two weeks. They wear an accelerometer that monitors their movement. And they're also provided a Freestyle Libre Pro uh, flash glucose monitor that looks at their glycemic control over the two weeks. We're able to do this study remotely because of COVID, so without any in-person contact. So there, we drop off the materials to them or mail it to them if they're, if they're not local. Um, for the, they're randomized to one of the two exercise uh, regimens, so either one 30-minute walk per day or three 10-minute walks after uh, each meal. Um, so they do that in the first week for five days and then uh, cross over to the other side uh, in the second uh, week for five days. And so we hope to get information about which uh, uh, exercise program is better for glycemic control and perhaps which one uh, patients are able to adhere to and which they prefer. Um, so we're recruiting for that study. So if you have any uh, women uh, that may be interested or patients that you know, or if you yourself have gestational diabetes and are interested, uh, please contact us. Um, so that's that's sort of uh, all I wanted to cover. I hope that's given um, you some idea of what we do in obstetric medicine and some of the research that uh, I've been pursuing. Uh, I wanted to thank um, uh, Dr. Davenport and Dr. Mia for uh, allowing me to use some of their slides and uh, for all the research collaborators that I work with, as well as the clinical colleagues that make my uh, job such a pleasure to do. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks, Rashmi. Um, Rashmi, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit and ask you about um, sort of the growth of the program and the number of consults that you're seeing right now. Like, um, you know, it, quite often we see patients sort of coming into um, our site and, and uh, to the university site and really not having those obstetric medicine um, uh, resources here. Um, you know, when, when is it appropriate uh, sort of to, to get you guys involved? Um, you know, what, what is your volume like? like? Are you guys doing telephone consults? Um, just if you can give us a little yeah. bit of yeah. background. Yeah. Of Carmen. So um, we, you know, we usually have a number of patients in our consult service. It varies quite dramatically. So sometimes we'll have a short list of eight to 10. Sometimes we'll have, you know, up to like 15, 18 patients. Uh, but we're always happy to have phone consults. So if you have a pregnant woman of any gestational age or anyone that's preconception, uh, we get phone consults all the time. So we get them from other hospitals. We get them from family doctors in the community. We get them from other internists. Um, you know, pick up the phone. We're happy to give phone advice. Um, often, uh, you know, if the patient is... Uh, viable and they have a viable pregnancy, that might be someone that we might need to consider is the location appropriate where they are now or do we need to help arrange transfer? So we don't have patients under our care, but we can help hook, hook you up with the obstetrician so that uh, if it's appropriate for transfer, they can be transferred over. Um, uh, we get calls from RAPID as well. So to provide advice and, uh, you know, sometimes these patients need the help of subspecialists at the university. So it's great when we can all talk together and manage them. So I guess just to that end, there have been a lot of questions for um, healthcare <coughs> workers that are pregnant and with the vaccination. Um, do you have any, uh, I don't know if you've gotten calls about that or if you've, you've had an opportunity to look into it. So I just thought I'd ask about that. Yeah, uh, great question. So I actually had to deal this recently. Um, I had a patient that I'd seen in the past preconception for hypertension and she newly became pregnant and she's an RT at the university hospital that works in the ICU. So she was in uh, the first round that was offered and she was six weeks pregnant. So, um, you know, I think the, the big thing is because the vaccine studies were not they did not include pregnant women. So this is like that little cartoon. I said, okay, it's, it's a catch 22. We're not going to test it. And then we're not going to offer you it because we didn't test it. It's, it's really quite um, terrible how pregnant women aren't at least offered the opportunity to, uh, to be in these studies. Um, so um, I think part of it is what is the risk of acquiring the disease? Because we know that COVID is also not 
good to have in pregnancy. So there seems to be increased risk of hospitalization, um, increased risk of ICU admission, and an increased um, risk of um, needing ventilation. And some of that might be because our thresholds are a little bit lower for admitting pregnant women and for admitting to the, to the ICU. But I think some of it is probably quite real because especially in the third trimester, these women are already working into their physiologic reserve. So they don't have as much reserve left. Um, and then we know in terms of uh, pregnancy outcomes, there are increases in uh, preterm birth. And, uh, you know, that can be pretty serious. So um, if it's a very individual thing, but if this is not a live vaccine, it's not a live virus vaccine, we give lots and lots of other vaccines to pregnant women um, without any concern in pregnancy. And so if, if the woman has a significant risk of exposure to COVID, um, then I think that they should consider getting the vaccine no matter what trimester they're in. Um, one thing we'd have to be cautious about is in the first trimester, we know that fever uh, leads to an increased risk of neural tube defects and congenital anomalies. So uh, we'd want to make sure we want to you know, uh, treat with fe uh, treat fever with Tylenol, or if a woman wants to delay things a little bit till she's after the first trimester as a personal choice, then I think that would be fine too. So the patient, the RT, she really couldn't avoid COVID because she was working with COVID patients directly, and uh, she felt her risk was higher, so she went and got had uh, had the vaccine even though she was, you know, in the first trimester. And I guess, have you um, been consulted on any patients with, you know, that huge surge we had? Um, I'm kind of surprised that there, if, if there weren't any pregnant women admitted yeah. during that time. Yeah, we have had some. So there's been um, a few have gone to the COVID ward if they really had no obstetrical concerns or if they didn't have a viable uh, baby. Uh, and then some of them have gone to the um, uh, obstetric wards. And so we followed them. And you know, fortunately, uh, we haven't had any of the ALEC that have uh, needed ventilation, uh, but I know at other centers uh, there have, and there have been, um, I was just listening to a webinar in the UK, and they've had, you know, a number of patients who've needed the ECMO during pregnancy. That's devastating. Um, so there's a question about your um, sort of uh, area of consultation. Um, do you accept uh, referrals for patients that come from either Northwest Territories or Northern BC? Yep. Yep. So we've, uh, so um, uh, sometimes we see those patients because they get transferred because of their obstetrical needs, but we do see outpatients um, uh, or, um, uh, you know, we've, the telephone consultation is a bit awkward sometimes depending on the privileging and the and the province and so on but um we we do our catchment area is big so northwest territories northern bc uh you know lloyd minster um red deer we we, we sort of serve that whole area and that includes pre-pregnancy right for advice like yes. with the chronic disease okay yes yes okay. we've we've had to limit a bit of our pre-pregnancy because of the COVID restrictions in terms of uh we're only allowed right to bring urgent patients in right now but yes yeah Okay, so hopefully that answers Dr. Bain's question. Um, and is substance use in pregnancy included among the issues you deal with? Yeah, um, so uh, we certainly see lots of patient, patients with it. Um, to be honest, we have an amazing ARCH team uh, at the Alex, so they actually help us out and have more expertise than I do on substance use in pregnancy. Um, and then uh, Dr. Chan, Lillian Chan, who uh, did some obstetric medicine training with us as part of our fellowship. She also has, uh, is part of the, uh, working with the ARCH team. So she's a great resource for, for that as well. Yeah, but in terms of direct referrals for substance abuse, we're probably not the best group. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like we have a little bit of time. So I'm going to ask, uh, so first of all, Rashmi, thank you and congratulations. Very well deserved. Um, and thank you on, on behalf of, of the department for uh, great rounds. Um, for those who are interested, um, there are some um, ongoing rounds at the Royal Alec um, specifically related to complications um, in pregnancy, whether it's, as you mentioned, um, uh, adrenal insufficiency or COVID or what have you. So we do advertise them. So just keep an eye out for that. It's Thursday mornings usually.